Hello, everyone, and welcome to Arthritis Talks, Complementary Therapies and Emerging Treatments. I'm Dr. Sean Bettman, Chief Science Officer at the Arthritis Society, and thank you for joining us today. Arthritis and the pain that often comes along with it can be very difficult to experience. When people are in pain, their quality of life isn't what they want it to be, and often look to various different treatment options in the hopes that one will provide relief. In today's day and age, there are so many products and treatment options that claim that they will help to treat arthritis, but it can be very challenging to find reputable, evidence-based information about whether or not they actually are effective. That's why we're here today, to look at the science and evidence behind some of the treatment options that we are most commonly asked about. Today, we're very happy to be joined by rheumatologist, Dr. Marianne Fitzcharles from Montreal. Dr. Fitzcharles will answer some of the most frequently asked questions that we receive about diet, physical activity, supplements, cannabis, and many others. Thanks to those of you who submitted questions in advance as they really did help to shape today's presentation. So before we get underway, just a few logistics. This webinar is best viewed on a laptop or a desktop computer. If you do have any technical difficulties, please email support at webcastcanada.ca for assistance. If you have a question for our presenter, you can submit it through the Ask a Question section at the top right of the screen. We'll try to get through as many questions as we possibly can in the time that we do have together. You can click on the chat window on the right of the screen to connect with other participants and the Arthritis Society's chat moderator. If you'd like to close the chat completely, please click the icon on the bottom right of your live stream window to view the webinar full screen. After receiving many requests from some of our previous attendees, we have included open captioning of today's session to accommodate the needs of our diverse audience. You'll see that running along the bottom of the page. I wanna take a moment to thank our event partners for their financial support of the event. Pfizer, Novartis, United Way Winnipeg, and the province of British Columbia. So we have a lot of information to cover today, so let's do get started. So thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Fitzcharles. Uh, let's start, if we could, by going back to some of the basics. What are some of the fundamental things that people living with arthritis should be doing to help them manage their disease? So good evening, and it really is a privilege to be able to connect with so many Canadians across the country. Um, and I'm going to, we're not going to be able to cover everything, but hopingly you're going to be able to take away a few practical points that are going to help you to manage particularly your pain uh, with your arthritis. So back to basics and we've become a very pill oriented society in the last 50 years. And we've often forgotten the important things that we can bring into our daily life that can really and truly make a huge impact upon our health. And we're going to address a number of these as we go along this evening. We're going to talk about healthy diet, exercise, sufficient sleep, um, it's very good to have a good night's sleep. And I have so many patients who say, just give me one solid night's sleep and I know I will feel so, so much better. Have a positive attitude. Um, it's so important to look at that glass half full and not half empty, to be involved in your care, not to sit back and sort of say, doctor, give me a pill and make me better. But what can you do to improve your overall wellness, your enjoyment of life? And also, so terribly important, we must do the best we can to control stress-related factors. And I think we have all experienced an unprecedented time in the last few months with COVID. And I am so impressed by how resilient so many of our patients are. And just a positive word, we will get through this. So let's talk about exercise. And so many people want to know, well, is exercise good for me? If I start doing exercise and it's painful, maybe I'm, I'm hurting myself. Now, we know that exercise has got many, many good factors. 
It is good for muscle tone. It is very good for our cardiovascular uh, effects. And it's also very good for our psyche. We know that when we're exercising, we actually are inducing our body to produce the endogenous opioids in the body, which dampen down pain. So this is a study that um, I think is, was absolutely beautiful and remember it because this study looked at 142 patients with osteoarthritis over a period of 18 months. And the recommendation was to do a moderate amount of exercise, not excessive, but also weight reduction. Now, what is the point that is so critical? The average weight reduction in this study was 3%. So if you think of the average person weighing about 150 um, pounds, that's only four pounds in weight. But a little weight reduction with associated exercise was almost as good as the studies that have given anti-inflammatory agents. So just remember, even if the weight reduction has been minimal by your standards, five pounds will make a huge difference. Now, another um, mechanical factor that we can also remember, that every one pound of weight is translated into four pounds of pressure through your knee joint, which means that every step you take, if you've lost five pounds, you're taking 20 pounds off that knee joint, which is wonderful. So how much exercise should you do? Well, the US Department of Health has recommended that we should be doing about 150 minutes a week, but you only need to do it in bouts of 10 minutes. So many people will say, I can't go, I can't go exercising for half an hour, that's just too much. 10 minutes once a day or twice a day is excellent. And I think we also have to set our goals as goals that we can achieve. So even if you're not doing any exercise, if you start off and say, I will, I'm going to do a walk, three minutes there and three minutes back, that's six minutes multiplied by five times a week, that's already 30 minutes. That's infinitely better than nothing. So any form of exercise. Now, what is the best exercise that we should use? Well, there is no best exercise. Essentially, a person should do what is enjoyable for themselves. They should do what they're able to maintain. They should do something that is easy for them to do. If you have to drive for 45 minutes in traffic to get somewhere for an exercise program and you're exhausted when you get there, that's not a very good idea. But we really need to do something that becomes a part of your usual life. For many patients with arthritis, it's probably better not to do terribly vigorous activity. And mind-body activities are great because mind-body helps to relax the person, but also to move everything. So I really strongly recommend people to do something that's enjoyable, but with a mind-body uh, access to it. Wonderful. So thank you so much, Dr. Fitzcharles. We also receive a number of questions about diet and nutrition and you know what diets are appropriate for people with arthritis, Neolithic, gluten-free, otherwise. So could you give your thoughts about what kinds of foods should people with arthritis be choosing? So this is a question that I'm asked almost every day uh, when I'm seeing patients. And let's just take a step back and look at what a little bit of the science has told us. Um, first of all, we've got to think of what is a healthy diet. And a healthy diet is a diet that allows us to have less fatty tissue. Now, fatty tissue in our bodies is not just there to keep us cozy and warm, but fatty tissue is an inflammatory tissue. And the more fatty tissue we have, 
the more inflammation we have. So inflammation is associated with obesity. Now, when we go into the laboratory, and uh, really the laboratory has informed how we manage our patients. And little mice that are given lots of vegetables to eat have much less inflammation if they have an inflamed arthritis. We also know from epidemiological studies that have particularly been done in China. China over the last 20 or 30 years, the Chinese people have changed their diet. They have become much more Western in their diet. And what is a Western diet? A Western diet is high sugar and high fat. And what has happened to the Chinese population? There is much more Western type disease, such as gout, cardiovascular disease, obesity, and even depression. So what is the culprit? Well, the culprit is too much animal protein. What we also know is that people with a low body weight and less fatty tissue overall live longer. So we're going to explore a little more carefully about the food that you might be eating. And I'm going to try to explain to you a little bit more about the microbiome story. We're also going to touch on some of the products that people are interested in. What's the factor regarding gluten, ginger, curcumin, etc. So as we have evolved from caveman into our current human being, our diet has changed. So thousands and thousands of years ago, our diet was predominantly vegetarian. And then we started hunting and eating meat. And thereafter, our diet was a mixed diet of both vegetables and meat. And finally, we've evolved into our Western diet, which is high fat, high sugar, and low fiber. Now, how has this impacted our, our health? And we believe it has impacted our health because it has caused a change in the microbiome. And we're going to talk about the microbiome now. So what is this microbiome that has been changed by our diet? Now, this little design over here, this little picture, I want you to imagine that it is your bowel. So on this side is the bowel lumen. And the bowel lumen is filled with trillions of bugs. And this is the bowel wall. And the bowel wall is a barrier because we do not want the bugs just to move from the bowel into our bodies. But why do we have bugs in our bowel? Well, the bugs play a very important role. They help us digest our food, but they also produce molecules that interact, that get into our circulation, and then send messages to our brain to allow us to be in connection with our outside environment. It's very, very complex, but it is very important. And you know that uh, if you're a little anxious, um, your brain has sent messages out back to your bowel and you probably have a little bit of diarrhea. Um, and you know that if you've eaten something a little different, um, sometimes you just don't feel as good as you should feel, or you feel a little blah. And probably what has happened is that there are some of these molecules that might be the bad molecules that have got into the circulation and are making you feel not so good. So the bowel is filled with trillions of bugs and it's not just one bug is good and one bug is bad, but it really is the balance of these bugs which becomes very important. 
And we have a lot of this knowledge from animal studies. And we are just beginning to get an understanding of this with human studies. So let's turn back to a person today who is suffering with an arthritis and saying, well, tell me, what can I do regarding my diet to help me? And what we say today is really increase the fiber in your diet and increase resistant starch. So where do we get fiber and resistant starch? And we know that these products help to nurture what we believe to be the good bugs in the gut. So lentils, beans, white beans, the navy beans, legumes, oats, uncooked oats, your muesli in the morning, anything that's brown, brown rice, brown bread, brown grains. Bananas are very good. They're a very good source of resistant starch. And cold rice. So you cook your rice, you put it in the fridge and warm it up. And when it's been cold, it becomes a resistant starch. So let's look a little at some of the diets that have become fashionable or people are asking about. And in fact, to study a diet in humans is very difficult. And you can understand that, you know, it's coming Christmas time. We don't want to have a diet restriction. You want to eat your chocolate and you want to have a little glass of wine, etc. But some of these studies have been done. And when we look at a gluten-free diet in patients with fibromyalgia, they followed the diet for a good 24 weeks. There was a reduction in gastrointestinal symptoms, but there wasn't very much change in other features. Another diet that is very fashionable is this FODMAP diet, which has been studied in fibromyalgia patients. It's a very difficult diet to follow. The, um, these fermentable oligo monosaccharides are poorly absorbed in the small gut, so they get into the large gut. And we believe that these fermentable saccharides really cause the bad bugs to become, to really overgrow. And people that adhered to this FODMAP diet actually had reduced gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, and this has been particularly shown in patients with irritable bowel syndrome. So when we look at what this FODMAP diet is, you'll see it's quite a difficult diet to follow. No, no wine for Christmas. Wheat. Wheat comes up again and again as being a problem, and we know that wheat um, has gluten in it. But on the other hand, I've just told you that beans and lentils we believe to be good, good agents to use. So we don't have a lot of information now to recommend to our patients to use a specific diet, but rather eat healthy. Lots of fruit, lots of vegetables, cut down on the meats. Thank you. That was a lot of information you just covered there. Um, this is another topic that we receive many questions about related to herbs and supplements. So turmeric, ginger, uh, many. So are there actually any herbs and supplements that have been proven to be effective for arthritis? So I think we have to go back and understand a little how we, how we evaluate products, how we evaluate drugs that we can advise our patients to use. So many of these herbal products have been used for thousands of years. Um, many of these herbal products have been shown in the laboratory to have very, very good effect on pain, on inflammation. However, we have very, very scanty studies of these products in human beings. So it's very difficult to do a completely valid, randomized, controlled trial 
of agents such as turmeric, ginger, echinacea, etc. But many patients will say that they have tried these agents and if an agent seems to work for you, and as long as you are using it within the recommended uh, dose by the provider, it probably is reasonable. But the scientific evidence is still really lacking. And the reason is to do a proper randomized controlled trial is exceedingly expensive. It costs millions of dollars. And these products are on the market. And I don't think that companies that are marketing them have got any great interest in proving that they really are working or not. So if you do consider trying one of these products, try it for a defined period of time. Tell your doctor that you want to try it because we're so happy when our patients share this information with us. But try it for a defined period of time Set your goals and say, at the end of two months, am I the same, better or worse? Because you don't want to be reaching into your pocket and spending a lot of money if you say, well, I'm really and truly not sure. So some of the agents that have been tested in fairly okay studies are curcumin, it was used quite a high dose, about 4,800 milligrams a day, and it was noted to have mild effect in osteoarthritis. So this is quite a considerable amount of cumin, curcumin. It's not just shaking a little bit on your rice. Ginger has been studied in arthritis. It is an agent that is very commonly used in the Middle and Far East. However, in the study in arthritis, there was no difference between uh, the placebo and the active, uh, the active agent. So are there any other beneficial herbs? Well, there is an agent called Devil's Claw or Harbophytum, a difficult name to say, which possibly has some effect in osteoarthritis. And echinacea is very interesting. This is the plant that many of us have in our gardens. And echinacea actually works by clicking onto one of the cannabis receptors in our body. I'm sorry, that's, we've got a, a fire alarm going out here. Sorry about that. Okay, I'm back again. So we're now going to move to our omega-3 fatty acids, good for arthritis. And omega-3, um, we can get in mostly fatty fish. And there have been studies showing that there is a small effect on pain in rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis. But you really have to take a good amount of omega-3 for a period of two to three months. Um, you should really reduce um, your fat content, such as your butter in your diet, use more canola oil, use olive oil, walnuts, flaxseed, and almonds. And then we're going to move now to topical treatments for arthritis. Now, I'm sure that if you go into your local health food store or you go into your pharmacy, you will see many of these agents on the shelf. And what I want to draw your attention to is look at what is inside these agents. So there's very often menthol, there's eucalyptol, there's camphor, there's capsaicin. Capsaicin comes from chilies. And then I've got a whole lot of uh, letters here, TRP and trip V1, what does this mean? And what are these agents? And this is what the magic is of these agents. So these are sensing um, pain receptors that are in, the, in our nerves. And these pain receptors, they pick up temperature. 
So cold temperature is picked up by a certain number of receptors, but it also picks up when you have mint. So you know that if you've got a mint in your mouth and you drink a glass of cold water, it feels uncomfortable, okay? Um, these heat receptors, TRYP-V1, is the same receptor that is activated by chilies. So these temperature receptors are activated both by temperature as well as by products such as cinnamon, mint, camphor, eucalyptus, chili. And these are the agents, and I'm going backwards again, that are present in many of these topical preparations. And this is probably why people will often say, I feel so much better when I've rubbed my joints with this or that. So I'd like to pick up on, you were speaking about echinacea and cannabis receptors. So could you tell us a little bit more about cannabis and in particular, again, the evidence around treating arthritis pain? So now we're going to move into cannabis, which is back to the future. And uh, there has been previously a very good uh, webinar done by the Arthritis Society on Cannabis, but I'm really going to focus quite a lot on CBD, which I think is an area of great interest. Now, cannabis has been used for more than 5,000 years. It has been part of ancient Chinese medicine. Cannabis is still one of the 50 fundamental herbs in Chinese traditional Chinese medicine. It's been used to treat inflammation and pain. And in fact, you could buy cannabis over the counter in the US um, until the early 1900s. And uh, in Scandinavia in the 1900s, cannabis was mixed with maltose and it was considered to be a very good lunchtime drink. Now, Queen Victoria actually used cannabis to treat her menstrual cramps. And this was between her many pregnancies. So let's talk a little bit about CBD. Why might CBD be good for arthritis? Well, there has been great hope for CBD. There is the concept that we can rub it into joints or just take a few drops under the tongue. We don't have to smoke it. We now have studies that have been done in children with epilepsy. And these children who have terrible, terrible epilepsy have been given very, very high doses of CBD and the World Health Organization has stated that CBD is safe and has almost no side effects. So this certainly has potential to be a really important product. Now, I want you to remember that the cannabis plant is a very, very complex plant. It has, it's been called the plant of a thousand molecules, and there's over a thousand strains of cannabis. Now, if you're a gardener, you know that you can have two plants that are exactly the same strain, but you can plant them in different parts of your garden, one in a shady area and one in a sunny area, one where there is beautiful fertilization and one where it's not so good, and the plants look different. And they look different because the molecular content of the plant is different. So I've told you this little story to emphasize that the strains, even although you've got strain, let's say, happy face, a uh, strain happy face might not be the same every time you purchase it or you have it. So this, the molecular content of the cannabis plant is really dependent upon growing conditions, harvesting, storage, and preparation. It is a plant. And I want you to remember that plants can be contaminated. They can be contaminated with heavy metals, pesticides, etc. So let's talk about CBD. So there is CBD, which is available over the counter, um, also by internet. You can order it and it can get delivered to your front door. It is considered to be a wellness product. It is part of dietary supplements. 
and it's also sold as hemp oil. So let's understand this a little bit better. CBD should be extracted from a cannabis sativa plant that has less than 0.3% of THC. And THC is the product that makes you, causes psychoactive effects, makes you feel a bit gaga, okay? So we should have CBD that is extracted from a plant with almost no THC. These products are sold as enriched products. So when it's enriched with cinnamon, cloves, turmeric, these are the agents we've been talking about earlier. It can be sold as pure or boosted CBD. So boosted CBD means they've added extra CBD to give it a higher concentration, up to 20%. And then there is full spectrum CBD which means that it's CBD, but it also has some of those other thousand molecules that you find in the cannabis sativa plant. So these are agents that we call terpenes, flavonoids, and this is what gives the, the scent of cannabis. And this has been called an entourage effect. And it's believed that the mixture of these other agents in the plant contribute to its effect. But there's a little warning here, and there's a little warning because these CBD products, these artisanal products, are not regulated. So they are not nearly as strictly regulated as are products such as drugs. And studies have been done where they have looked at, they've gone and bought various CBD commercial products from US, Europe, and Canada, and examined them. And unfortunately, the labeling of what's in the product doesn't necessarily reflect what is in the bottle. And it was identified, it's been identified multiple times, that the accuracy in the labeling is only 30%, so only 30% of products are accurately labeled. And what is most concerning is that at least 20% of the CBD products that were examined in the US, Canada, and Europe contain THC. And the FDA, the Federal Drug and uh, Agency of the US, has really issued warnings to these CBD manufacturers regarding inaccurate labeling. There has been one arthritis study um, looking at CBD, and this was a very, very interesting study and was of, of great interest to us. It was osteoarthritis and it was done in Australia, and there was application of a CBD cream to osteoarthritis knees. Overall, the response was fairly good. So, but it didn't quite hit the mark. It didn't hit that barrier because the placebo response was very, very good. So we see a CBD response of about 50%, whereas placebo was 34%. And unfortunately, this company has decided not to pursue uh, this product. But I also want to bring to your attention that what's this funny little pink uh, diagram at the bottom here? Now, CBD is a lipid substance. It's a lipid. And if we put, if you put hand cream on your hands, the hand cream only gets to the superficial layers of the skin. The hand cream is unable to penetrate right down into your joint. Now, cannabinoid products and CBD are lipid products, so they like the hand cream. And unless they are encased in a carrier molecule, they're going to stay on the surface of the skin and not penetrate down into the joint area. And we mostly have no idea whether the products that are being sold as topical products have got these carrier molecules. So we don't know.
But again, I think that if a patient says that I've been using the agent and I really feel good and it's doing well, I have no problems with continuing to use. Okay. So let, let's move on to this other topic um, of, of therapy, stem cells, uh, platelet-rich plasma, et cetera. What can you tell us about the evidence surrounding those? So I think we'll start off with looking at the costs, because I think this is important. So stem cell therapy in the U.S., costs for osteoarthritis of the knee costs about $5,000. Chondrocyte implants can cost between four and $18,000. So we're talking, talking about big bucks here. Plasma-rich platelets injected into the knees, about 700. And prolotherapy, one shot is $150, but the recommendation is about six injections, 1,000. So first of all, we're looking at costly treatments. Number two, let's go back to stem cell therapy because this is, uh, was or is still quite a commonly advertised treatment by many clinics in Canada. And Health Canada has issued a statement to say that stem cell therapy is a therapy that should be given for only specific diseases, certain cancers and graft versus host disease. There are currently many trials ongoing and stem cell therapy is not a standard recommended treatment for any arthritic condition. There are many trials that are in process. There are many different ways that you can harvest the stem cells and prepare them. So you can either get them from abdominal fat or from bone marrow. It is very important the way the stem cells are actually being um, managed, how they are being extracted. And the standard studies are telling us that there might be some effect in mild osteoarthritis in younger people. But this is certainly not a treatment that we would recommend our patients to be using at this stage. We do not have sufficient information. It might be when we have better understanding of this, it might be an option in a number of years time. Chondrocyte implants also is an orthopedic procedure that is currently being studied extensively. And what they do is they take chondrocytes, which is the cartilage cells from one area, make a little, scratch a little bit and implant it into an area of the joint that sort of is irregular. Um, the science is moving ahead regarding chondrocyte implants. They seem to be short term effects, but we do not know what the long term effects are and pretty, pretty expensive. Platelet rich plasma is also something that has been uh, has been very widely publicized. Um, it's used in horses. It used in horses very, very effectively. There have been studies in osteoarthritis suggesting that it might be a little bit better than the hyaluronic acid for effect on pain. And finally, prolotherapy, which is injecting an irritant, which is either dextrose or salt, into an area to cause an irritation, an inflammatory reaction. Um, and the studies to date are of low quality evidence. So our understanding at this point is it's probably better not to go that route. Thank you, Dr. Fitzcharles. This group here of, of complementary therapies are also frequently asked about massage, acupuncture, et cetera. Could we, could we get a little bit of information about those? Good. So these treatments really add to the management of pain and arthritis. 
physiotherapists do a fantastic job. They do a fantastic job in getting us over a tricky time. So if you're having an important flare of your back pain, a physiotherapist or a chiropractor or a massage therapist can often get you over that difficult time. But it is so important that you become the manager of your body, that you don't become dependent or addicted to your practitioner, that your practitioner sets you on a track and gives you a program of exercises that you can do on your own every day. Massage therapy is very good to reduce an acute spasm of muscles, but you need to follow this on with doing a good exercise program. Acupuncture, acupuncture does give relief for some patients. Acupuncture might dampen down pain, but it doesn't change the inflammatory process. And relaxation, just lying on the couch and relaxing all day is nice, but it's not sufficient. So relaxation, yes, to reduce stress, relaxation meditation in limited periods of time is absolutely wonderful, but it's not enough. You have to add it to physical activity. And acceptance and mindfulness therapy is becoming very, very important. And acceptance that, yes, this is the situation I do have a chronic illness, it's not going to be cured, but how can I continue with my life? So even in a setting of illness, let us just move on, continue life participation, and try to move away from the sick role. So TENS, and there are lots of people that have asked questions about TENS, and the evidence is limited for effect on pain. But again, similar to our studies of herbal products that are really maybe not as high quality as I, we would like them to be, many of the studies on TENS have been considered to be a lower quality of study. And what makes it lower quality? Well, if there are not many patients in the study. So if you think of uh, when we study and one of the anti-inflammatory drugs, we study thousands of patients, whereas a study of tens might be a study of 70 patients, which immediately downgrades it to a lower quality study. Acupuncture, either alone or in combination with other treatments, may be helpful in decreasing myofascial pain. So myofascial pain is the same pain that can be helped with massage, exercise, dancing, doing all of those good things. Dry needling also has promise, especially for short-term effects, but we do not know what the long-term effect is. So this was a little... Um, table that was set out by one of my good colleagues, Don Goldenberg, a number of years ago, stating the strength of the evidence for pain management. And look at the top, strong evidence for aerobic exercise. And in fact, I would change that and I'd say any exercise, water exercise, aerobics, tai chi, whatever you enjoy. Number two, Cognitive behavioral therapy, we can't access it for everyone, but really this is saying, yes, this is what it is, and how can I get on with life? Patient education. There is moderate evidence for, here comes our acupuncture for pain. Hypnotherapy, so hypnotherapy is sort of the stage beyond meditation. And if you can't get hypnotherapy, Relaxation and meditation, very good. Balneotherapy, we don't have that. That's uh, going to the spa. And in fact, in Europe, they are able to access balneotherapy um, under their healthcare system. 
weaker evidence for manual massage therapies, an ultrasound, and no evidence for trigger point injections. But again, this is looking at the total um, literature. And I must say that uh, in our pain clinic, we often do use trigger point injections in selected patients with uh, fairly good results. Thank you so much, Dr. Fitzcharles. You've covered so much ground there. Uh, before we turn it over to some questions that we received tonight, do you have any final thoughts that you want to leave our audience with? So the final thoughts are that we have many, many alternative treatments that really have very good laboratory evidence, but unfortunately, they have not been studied according to the high standards of research. But what we will say to patients that if you are considering use, use only the dose recommended on the bottle. So don't think uh, more is better. Use for a defined period of time and then assess whether there have been good effects and also assess whether there have been any side effects. Tell your doctor, tell your pharmacist, because the pharmacists have got these wonderful computer programs that they can click in and make sure that the product that you're using is not perhaps having a negative interaction with one of the drugs that have been prescribed. And finally, balance the cost and the benefit because you don't want to be reaching into your pocket very deeply for a long period of time. And then at the end of it saying, well, I'm really not sure that it did or didn't make a good effect. Thank you. Thank you so much. So now we're gonna take some questions from the audience. And I first actually wanna pick up on two points that you were just touching on, as I think they're very important. And, and the first is really around drug interactions. And there are a few questions about um, what do we know about what you've just presented, some of those options as they might relate to some other prescription drugs that people could be taking, methotrexate, biologics, et cetera. So we have very little information regarding drug interactions and particularly herbal products. One product that I did not mention to you is St. John's wort. And St. John's wort is used mostly for mental health, for help with depression, et cetera. And St. John's wort has been associated with what we call accelerated metabolism of some drugs. So that means that some of the drugs, and these are mostly immunosuppressive drugs, will be broken down too quickly and we will not have them in the system. So St. John's wort is the one which we didn't really talk much about. And cannabis has a potential to reduce the effect of some of the um, agents that we use as blood thinners and also has the potential to reduce the activity of tofacitinib, which is one of the agents that we use to treat rheumatoid arthritis. But much of the drug interaction is theoretical, and I would just suggest that you speak to your pharmacist. Thank you. And then picking up on the dosing comments, in particular related to CBD, if someone's thinking about CBD or starting on CBD, what would the dosing normally look like? So, what we and what we generally say is CBD is generally obtained in a bottle, and in the bottle it's very often about 300 milligrams per 30 milliliters, which means that it's 10 milligrams for one milliliter, and we will often say begin with about 2.5 milligrams. And I really encourage my colleagues as well as patients to look at the milligram amount. We don't use drugs by taking a bite of a cookie or a little piece of a brownie or a few drops of this or a few drops of that. We dose our drugs by knowing the milligram amount. So 
perhaps start with something like 2.5 milligrams and then increase by about 2.5 milligrams maybe every three to five days. But I want you to remember that all of the CBD that we are able to access from the growers in Canada all have a little bit of THC. So it is not free of THC. And I have had a number of patients who have tried CBD and say, I just didn't feel myself. And that was because they were reacting to the, even a tiny amount of CBD. Okay. And just, just to follow this point around CBD, because there were a number of questions when you were talking about lipid carriers. Could you just explain a little bit more about what that means? And there are some people asking whether they can make their own formulations that would solve the problem that you were trying to identify. <laughs> so that's really a very, uh, that's, this is a question for our chemists. So hmm. a lipid carrier, because it's a lipid molecule, this molecule of CBD has got to be encased in a sort of a carrier in a little packet that is really what we call hydrophilic as opposed to lipophilic. So hydrophilic means it can dissolve happily in water and hydrophilic molecules can get all the way through the skin down into our joints. Now the study that I presented from uh, Australia they had a very sophisticated um, carrier molecule and they called ethosomal molecules. But um, I wouldn't have a clue how to do that. Okay. Um, that's great. So we do have a number of follow on questions related to diet and nutrition. So one in particular, can you comment on um, vegetables like tomatoes, potatoes, eggplants, nightshade vegetables? Do they actually promote inflammation? So there's a lot of interest in um, particular vegetables or things that do bad things. Now, these nightshade vegetables, which is everything that makes a lovely, delicious ratatouille, um, as you said, tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, and potatoes. And they have got a chemical in them called solanine. I had to write it down. And solanine in high concentrations is toxic. And the reason why these vegetables have this toxic chemical is to prevent animals from eating them. So it's a protection for the plant. If you eat a lot of this chemical, yes, it can be dangerous for you, but you've got to eat masses amounts of it. And they say something like, uh, you know, if your potato has gone green, you probably need to eat pounds and pounds of green potatoes to have any negative effect from the solanine chemical. So although there have been suggestions that these agents induce inflammation, um, there is no solid scientific evidence. However, what I would say to people is that if every time you eat uh, a nice tomato salad and you just don't feel good, don't eat a tomato salad. Um, I think we all have bodies that are very different, but I don't think you're getting poisoned with this solanin chemical. Okay. Um, so we're focused primarily on arthritis. We've been talking a lot about rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis. What about fibromyalgia? Do some of the therapies that you spoke to, do we know a lot about what they do in fibromyalgia patients? So fibromyalgia is so, so much of a challenge for us because we don't totally understand exactly what's happening in this condition. We know that the nervous system is fired up for some reason, and we really want to do the very best we can to cool down this fired up nervous system. So as I did mention, we did, we have uh, studies of both the FODMAP diet as well as gluten-free diet, and they didn't seem to do very much for all the overall symptoms of fibromyalgia. 
but we do know that many patients with fibromyalgia have associated irritable bowel syndrome. And adjusting the food did dampen down symptoms of irritable bowel in these patients. And, you know, if there is some little area that is improved, I'm sure patients are very grateful for that. But again, we don't have good studies of particularly these alternative products or these herbal products in fibromyalgia. Okay. And can you expand a little bit on the impact of a high salt diet on people with arthritis? I don't think we have any evidence that high salt does anything for arthritis. We certainly have concerns about salt and hypertension, and that has been considered to be one of the major reasons why the Western world has so much blood pressure. But specifically on arthritis, no. Okay. And I think you touched on this on, on, in your last slide. There are questions related to things like, is Aquafit good? Is walking 10,000 steps a day good? Is yoga good? Maybe you can just emphasize your thoughts around those different activities. So once, once again, I think the philosophy should be to do any physical activity that is enjoyable for you and is sustainable. So I remember actually a few weeks ago, I was speaking to one of my patients uh, over the telephone as we all are doing. And I asked him, what, what health-related physical activity are you doing? And he said, well, I'm not doing anything. So I said, well, how, how are you spending your day? And he said, oh, I'm, I'm in the garden all day and I've been raking leaves. I said, you're doing wonderful health-related physical activity. So health-related physical activity is not necessarily going to the gym. It's doing activity that is normal, is natural, but just going walking is perfect. We know that weight-bearing exercise is excellent for osteoporosis. It's excellent for bone, bone health. But many patients with bad arthritis have great difficulty walking. So that is when Aquafit becomes very good. Chair yoga for someone who has difficulty standing. Chair yoga is wonderful. And I tell my patients, turn up the radio, put on one of those jazzy, uh, jazzy uh, musical things and sit and dance in your chair. Thank you so much, Dr. Fitzgerald, for sharing so much of your expertise with us today. I think that's all we have time for. Uh, for our audience, the video and the presentation slides will be emailed to everybody this week. And we will also post this on our website very shortly. I also do encourage participants to visit our drug-free pain management tool available at arthritis.ca. And that has a lot of information about some of the things that we discussed today. We would just like to take a few moments of your time, if we could, to get your feedback on today's presentation. So for those of you who are on a laptop or desktop computer, you should see a poll question come up on your screen very soon. So please do click on the answer that reflects your thoughts. Importantly, did you find this information in today's webinar helpful to you? Yes or no? We will be sending an evaluation form out as well when we send out the recording. So if you're unable to access the poll questions and you have other thoughts, that is certainly your opportunity to share them with us. Once again, thank you to Pfizer, Novartis, United Way Winnipeg, and the province of British Columbia for the financial support of this event. We invite you to support us as we work to continue to create valuable resources to help you better manage your arthritis. If you are able, please do consider visiting arthritis.ca slash donate. And finally, I wanted to share that advocating to all levels of government on behalf of people with arthritis is a key area of focus for our organization. And in particular, we're interested in critical issues like providing arthritis patients with access to medical cannabis, that is tax-free and available through pharmacies, the implementation of a national pharmacare program and reducing wait times for joint replacement surgeries. So our efforts and voice is certainly amplified when we have patient stories to share. So if you are passionate about any of these and you're willing to lend your voice to our cause, please do email us at arthritistalks at arthritis.ca. 
And at this moment, we're particularly interested in hearing from anyone who is waiting for joint replacement surgery. Our next event, Arthritis Talks, Tips, Tricks, and Tools to Manage Arthritis is coming up on Thursday, January 21st. To register for that event, please visit arthritis.ca slash arthritis talks. This concludes Arthritis Talks, Complementary Therapies and Emerging Treatments. On behalf of all of us, thank you for joining us today and do please stay well. <laughs>